And one of the things that I think is, is terribly exciting is the idea of aquaponics. We have food deserts throughout the world. We have them in core city neighborhoods. We have them in developing nations. We have them uh, it, just in places where people are impoverished. And if we are really going to attack a culture of poverty, we must be able to feed the people. Now, of course, there's more to it than that. The, the Millennium Development Goals, uh, as one set of guidelines, inform us that there are many levers that need to be pushed down at the same time in order to eliminate poverty and to bring people to a point in their lives where the playing field is level, where they have a, a chance to live healthy, happy, and productive lives. But at the core of these Millennium Development Goals are economic development, education, and health initiatives. And if we can teach people to grow their own food, we can teach them to eat healthily, we can teach them to live healthily, if we can teach them to grow their own food, we can give them jobs, we can give them businesses, we can create an agribusiness economy in which they have an equity stake. And that is extraordinarily important. They need to have ownership in all that which they do. And it's up to us to help provide it. And the third piece of that is education. This opens the doors, one of the portals to education, an education that's so important to them in all that they do in their lives. So that's what we're about. We're about the business of gathering together people of all faith, but using specifically the resources of the Anglican Communion. And we think it's a very, very powerful time in which we live and we have powerful opportunities. And with that comes powerful responsibility. Hi, we are Beth and Stuart Kerwin, and we give to the cathedral to help support all the various ministries, um, Blessings in a Backpack, the St. Mary's Food Pantry, and all the other wonderful work that the cathedral does here in the district and around the city. Welcome to St. John's Virtual Service. We're so glad you could worship with us.
Good morning, my friends, and welcome to our virtual worship service here at St. John's Cathedral. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. In order to fully participate in the worship this morning, we ask you to have a few tools at your disposal in front of your screen. The first would be a Book of Common Prayer um, in hard copy, or you can also find it on the web. The second would be a candle, and we will ask you to light that candle as we say our prayers. Thirdly, we would love for you to have a piece of bread before you so that you can share with us in this mystical meal that we enjoy together. And finally, last but not least, we actually want you to have your cell phones. There will be a time during the service where we will pass a virtual plate of sorts, and we will invite you to text in a gift, if you so choose. Our opening hymn to begin our worship this morning is number 410. Him 410. Son and Holy Spirit. And, and blessed, blessed be, be his God's kingdom, kingdom now, now and forever. forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. 
and even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Exodus. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people should go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall, you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of, of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? for they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now let us sing together hymn number 676. We will sing the first verse before the gospel and the second verse after the gospel. Thank you.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into the vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He said to them, you others standing idle, you go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around and he said to them, why are you standing idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more but each of them also received the usual daily wage. When they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I gave to you. And I'm not, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. this morning to welcome to our pulpit uh, Robert Lee, priest and CEO of Fresh Ministries, where he has been for 26 years. Robert is an honorary canon of this diocese um, because the work that he does um, helps people both here in Jacksonville and all over the world. Robert has been part of so many different kinds of relief ministries which have spanned the globe from Africa 
to the Virgin Islands and Haiti, to the United States and right here on our doorstep where Fresh Ministries runs incredible programs in the heart of Jacksonville. We are particularly excited to have a closer relationship with Robert and with Fresh Ministries and particularly excited about their new aquaponics tanks which they are building all over the world uh, promoting um, an environment in which people can breed fish and grow, grow, grow vegetables uh, and sustain themselves. So welcome, Robert. So great to have you today. Thank you so much, Kate. You know, I have to say, not only have I been at Fresh Ministries for 26 years, I don't know where the time goes, but I've been in the diocese over 30 years. And um, I have to say, that being in this place is always a great joy in this cathedral. Being with the, the laity, with all the people who make this such a joy-filled place, with the clergy. Kate, thank you so much for inviting me back. And, and uh, Father Bob, it's always a pleasure to be with you, my friend. So thank you. Thank you all very, very much. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to talk today about a very difficult subject. I want to talk about lies. All of us are victims of a lie. Did you know that? All of us are victims of some sort of a lie. Somewhere, somehow, in the course of our lives, we have all been made to believe at least one lie. Sometimes it simply infects us as individuals, and sometimes it becomes epidemic as it permeates whole communities. I was thinking recently about these lies and what they do in our lives, and I was reminded of a, a girl from my childhood. Her name was Julie Pescar, and her story is extreme, and, and it's very sad. The seeds of the lie that changed her life were planted by her mother when she was very young. And I suspect that they were the same seeds that her grandmother planted in her mother and all of the mothers back generations. We, we tend to do that, you know. We, we give to our children oftentimes that which has been given to us, both good and bad. But these these particular seeds were particularly insidious. They were seeds that once sown paved the way for lies that would alter her life. You see, Julie's mother, caught up in her own destructive web, used to scream constantly at Julie. And she'd tell her she was bad. She was a bad girl. Not even that she was acting like a bad girl, but she was bad, a bad human being. Rarely was there any positive communication, almost always it was negative. At the time it was embarrassing to watch, and in retrospect, it was heartbreaking. You can see Julie begin to bow, to give way unto the weight of the words from her mother, bad girl, bad girl, bad girl. And then one day, as if to visibly mark Julie forever with the seal of her disdain, her mother, in a fit of rage, threw a cup of hot coffee at Julie and scarred her from life, for life, from breast to chin. And of course, this made Julie look slightly different from the other children with whom she played. And being as cruel as children can sometimes be, they made a play on words around her last name, the name Pescar. And pointing to Julie's upturned nose and then to her scar, they would chant, pig scar, pig scar, pig scar. And suddenly, as it does with most of us who go through this kind of trauma, somewhere in all the agony she endured, the moment arrived. Like the people of generations before her, this innocent little girl heard a voice, a small voice, it was in her own mind. It was a voice reminiscent of the one that spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden so many years ago, which we translate from the Hebrew to serpent. The word is nahash. 
The serpent, or literally translated, means to whisper. And that's what this voice was, a whisper from within that said, maybe I really am bad. Maybe that's why I'm so ugly. And the lie that was so firmly planted in her mind became so deeply rooted that the rest of her adolescent life was colored by the terrible whispers of pig scar, pig scar, pig scar. You are a bad, bad girl. The damage done to Julie and all of us who have been victims of the lie is tragic. But the tragedy doesn't stop there. At that point, it becomes easy. It becomes so easy to become subtly or, or perhaps not so subtly enslaved by the lies that we believe. Some about ourselves, to be sure, but so many other lies we begin to believe about others. And the outcomes are horrific. It can be really ugly, right? Failing in our ability to love ourselves as God loves us, we fall into a pit where we don't want to be. We fail to embrace our neighbors with the unconditional, non judgmental, and selfless love with which we are called upon to live. And before we know it, the whispering of the servant, the nachash, becomes a constant companion, and the whispering lies begin to color far too much of our existence. A week or so ago, I was on the phone with my friend Mikey. He's the son of some very good friends of mine. I've known him since he was born, and he's always shown himself to be an intuitive, spiritual, caring, uh, very intelligent. And somewhere in the conversation, we began to talk about the current crises in our country and around the world. We weren't talking about COVID-19 or the wildfires or the hurricanes or climate change or any of the challenges that are being presented to us by nature this summer. We were talking about the current collective condition of all of us, the people. And Mikey said to me, you know, Uncle Robert, as we are speaking, I'm outside walking around the cul-de-sac where we live. We know most of our neighbors, we know them well. We've gotten to know them since we moved in and we all want the same things. We want good lives for our families. We want our children to be safe, to be happy, to grow up with opportunities to succeed at whatever they do. We all just want to, and I interrupted them, and as a priest I cut in and said, find and live with the peace that passes all understanding. And he said, that's exactly right. But he went on to say that that peace is deeply disturbed in his neighborhood. There are the political signs, yard signs for Donald Trump and Joe Biden and others. But the signs, he said, aren't simple indications of political preference. Rather, they are reflective of a deep, very ugly crack in our society that keeps neighbors and even closest friends from hearing one another, from understanding one another, and indeed from loving one another. And in that context, in the absence of our faith as the North Star, the Nachash, the Whisper, slithers on. There's a wonderful song we often sing in church. I'm sure you know, know it. it. It begins like this. Be not afraid. I go before you always. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. It's an invitation by God. These words, come, follow me, provide us a blueprint for peace in our lives. Follow the light. Don't stick your head out any dark windows. Simply follow the light. Follow the light. But it's never been easy for we human beings, has it? In our reading from 
Exodus today, we heard about the followers of Moses 3,000 years ago being led by God to the promised land. The glory of God, the light of God leading them. It appeared to them in a cloud. And they were given the promise of, of new life. But what did they do? They did what we've always done, right? At critical moments, they put aside their faith. They began to complain. God doesn't understand our needs. I'm hungry. We want more meat and bread. The promised land probably isn't even real. And no matter what God provided them, they were never satisfied. And the original text reads that they began to murmur. Nachash haya, to whisper in the wilderness. And led by the serpent, they did begin to stick their heads out dark windows as they listened to the lies. Turning their backs on the God who loved them, they began to craft their own idols. They began to craft their own deities. Deities that better fit the narrative of the lie. I read a story recently about a Texas oilman. Uh, Father Bob can tell me whether this is true or not. I don't know. It, apparently he died and went to heaven and he was met by St. Peter who said, um, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that you've been accepted into heaven. Well, fantastic, said the oil man, but what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is that that section of heaven reserved for oilmen is full. Well, I can fix that, said the Texan. Take me over there. When they arrived, the Texan called the attention of all the resident oilmen there, and, and he declared, exciting news. They struck oil in hell, and with that, the whole place emptied out. And St. Peter, amazed, said, well, now you can go in. Are you kidding, said the Texan? I'm going to hell. I hear they've struck oil there. It's a corny story, but it also makes a point. People believe what they want to believe, and it begins with their own lies. So what are we to do? What can we do? Wrapped and rewrapped in a world of expectation, that expectation created mostly by ourselves, living in a season of incredible bombardments of falsehoods, false values, false idols. How do we find our way? What do we do? Where do we turn? We turn, brothers and sisters, to the one who is the way, the one who is the truth, and the one who is the light. We turn to God. The gospel always brings the good news. It, it's the great news, but it's not always easy news. Today's reading from Matthew is one with which most people have great difficulty. How could it be fair for a worker who toiled all day in the fields be paid the same wage as a latecomer who only worked for one hour? Hmm? Doesn't that cause a little anxiety in most of us? Where's the justice in that? Well, the truth of the matter is that this great piece of news isn't about our sense of judgment. It's about God's grace. It's about the totality of God's love, freely given to everyone, no matter what their condition or what their situation, and despite their merits. And the question to us is this. Would we rather live by faith, accepting the all-inclusive love of God? Or would we rather rely on our own sense of justice, our own judgment with regard to how we live our lives? 
Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Nobel Peace Prize laureate and a giant in our church and one who I'm very proud to have had opportunity to work with wrote, God's dream is that you and I and all of us will realize that we are family, that we are made for togetherness, for goodness, and for compassion. We are made for togetherness, for goodness, and for compassion. Whether or not we live that dream, whether we join that family is a choice that each one of us has to make. And I believe that it's an all-in decision. Do we want to be children of God? Do we want to belong to the family of God? Or will we allow our lives to be left to the whispers, to the nachash, Will we live by our own short-sighted judgment of those around us? Or will we turn to what we know lights the light within us? This is a crazy cacophony of noise that surrounds us in the world these days. But still, this is an unbelievably beautiful world that God has created the components of which are bound together in deep harmonies of boundless love. It is that love, it's in that love, that we can find our way, we can find our truth, and we can find the light that leads us home. Amen. And now let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. The Creed is found on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we pray together, please light the candle that sits beside your computer or television. Please respond with the words, hear our prayer. Gracious and eternal God, you have created the human race in all its beauty, beauty and diversity. Bring an end to this pandemic that we may emerge safely and with greater reverence for human life. And also bring an end to the fires on the West Coast in order to help preserve this precious earth that you have given us. Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. You sent the Holy Spirit upon us to teach us how to speak the language of others. Help us to listen to one another and learn from one another. 
Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. Restore to health all those who battle the coronavirus or any other illness. Heal them and bless them. Holy Spirit, hear our hear prayer. prayer. Bless those who have died. Welcome them into your loving embrace. Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. prayer. Be present with those who suffer from economic hardship. Help us all to become bold innovators, steadfast in strength, a people of hope and generosity. Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. Descend upon us as you descended upon the disciples in the upper room, that we may be so filled with your presence that we emerge to change the face of the earth. Holy Spirit, hear our hear prayer. prayer. Almighty God, we ask you to help us discern between the lies and the whispers that call us into the darkness and the voice of your Son, the good news. Turn our hearts to the light, O Lord, and may we follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. We are so glad that you've joined us today, and it's so wonderful to have you with us, Robert. Thank you, thank you. That was awesome. I want to continue to encourage you to visit our website. There are so many offerings going on every day, from worship to classes to support groups. So please find your way through the virtual reality that is going on now in your church and make a place for yourself. I want you to join this community in as much as you feel called to do. We continue to raise uh, the gift of food for the St. Mary's Food Pantry. And again, I want to thank everyone who brought groceries by on my birthday. That was so wonderful. If you want to continue, when you go to the grocery store, just think of buying one extra bag of food. If we all do that, we'll be able to support the hungry through this pandemic. And you can drop these groceries off here at the cathedral. We will deliver them to St. Mary's. Fall classes started this Wednesday and also today. See the website for details. And remember that this morning we have one in-person worship going on at the same time as you're able to view this service at 10 o'clock. Our altar flowers this morning are given by Carolyn Adams, and they're beautiful. And last but not least, I want to encourage you to be generous in this time with your cathedral. And if you can, get out your phone and text the number 73256. And write in the message, J-A-X, Cathedral, then a dollar sign, and any amount that you want to give, you can send it right on to us. Isn't that amazing technology? Incredible. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Today's musical offering is an arrangement of Jesu, Joy of Man's Desiring, by J.S. Bach. This piece is derived from Bach's cantata number 147, which was composed in 1723. One of the most recognized and widely arranged pieces in all of classical music, Jesus' Joy of Man's Desiring has been adapted for everything from guitar to synthesizer. The hymn that the text is based on was originally written in 1661 by Martin Janus, a German Protestant minister and church musician.
We continue in the Book of Common Prayer on page 367. And placing your bread in front of you, let us join together in this mystical feast. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift Let them to, to the, the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give, give him thanks, thanks and praise. praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. 
Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, please pick up your bread at home and hold it up. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, Before, let, let us, us keep, keep the, the feast. feast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may consume your bread at home with us and pray for Christ to enter your heart. Now let us pray together the post-communion prayer on page 365. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you. Hallelujah. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.
Thank you for joining us at the St. John's Virtual Service. We hope you'll be back next week. And one of the things that I think is, is terribly exciting is the idea of aquaponics. We have food deserts throughout the world. We have them in core city neighborhoods. We have them in developing nations. We have them uh, it, just in places where people are impoverished. And if we are really going to attack a culture of poverty, we must be able to feed the people. Now, of course, there's more to it than that. The, the Millennium Development Goals, uh, as one set of guidelines, inform us that there are many levers that need to be pushed down at the same time in order to eliminate poverty and to bring people to a point in their lives where the playing field is level, where they have a, a chance to live healthy, happy, and productive lives. But at the core of these Millennium Development Goals are economic development, education, and health initiatives. And if we can teach people to grow their own food, we can teach them to eat healthily, we can teach them to live healthily. If we can teach them to grow their own food, we can give them jobs, we can give them businesses, we can create an agribusiness economy in which they have an equity stake. And that is extraordinarily important. They need to have ownership in all that which they do. And it's up to us to help provide it. And the third piece of that is education. This opens the doors, one of the portals to education, an education that's so important to them in all that they do in their lives. So that's what we're about. We're about the business of gathering together people of all faith, but using specifically the resources of the Anglican Communion. And we think it's a very, very powerful time in which we live and we have powerful opportunities and with that comes powerful responsibility.